Dick, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us today about this unbelievable vehicle, the Blue Flame. In October 1970, now 50 years ago, you and your friends set a fantastic record that should last more than 15 years. You broke the barrier of this immense number of 1,000 kilometers per hour. We would really like to know where the intention of the dream came from to reach 1,000 kilometers per hour on land. Well, that's a, a long story. Actually, uh, back in the 1950s, when I was a teenager, uh, we were all car crazy. That was the technology of the time. We didn't have computers and all the modern marbles, but automobiles were definitely things that we were interested in and automobile performance. So we always asked when a new car came out, how fast will it go? And occasionally we would borrow our parents' cars and find out how fast they would go. <laughs> Not a very safe uh, thing to do. But uh, anyhow, racing was uh, very popular and we were street racing initially, which was very dangerous. And in fact, I lost some friends that way. Uh, gradually organized drag racing began and then uh, they were running uh, speed trials, uh, Southern California Timing Association on the Bonneville Salt Flats. And this was being publicized also in the uh, Hot Rod magazines. So we were very much enthused about speed back in the day. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of what got us going. How did you and your partners find each other? How did you become a team? Well, first of all, Pete Farnsworth and I were both involved in drag racing. He was uh, actually building and racing dragsters, and I had uh, a, a slower car, slower class uh, a, a gas coupe. But we had a mutual friend, Chuck Sua, who later would be the driver of our X1 rocket car. And Chuck Suba had a uh, race car shop in Evanston, Illinois. And we used to all gather there uh, and tell some racing stories and drink beer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how Pete and I met. Uh, Ray Dousman, on the other hand, uh, I was working at the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology Research Institute, uh, working in contract research mm -hmm. uh, in the chemistry research department. We were doing contract research for industry and government. Uh, Ray Dussman was also working there in a different area, but we lived in the same building on campus. It was the faculty housing, and we would often have lunch together at the IIT uh, cafeteria. So he was interested in rockets. I was interested in uh, drag racing, and we shared stories and I actually took him to a drag race one time and he looked at the, uh, the tires uh, burning and the engines making a lot of noise and exhaust. And uh, he said, oh, a rocket could do that much better. <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of started the adventure. We began talking about that more and more at lunchtime and eventually decided to try and pursue it on a small scale. What a nice idea. Were there any changes during the construct construction of the Blue Flame or was the, the, the result like on the first drawings? Well, uh, the biggest problem we had initially, we were trying to uh, get our tires from Firestone and they had sponsored uh, Art Arfons. But uh, Art Arfons had a crash in, in his Green Monster and Firestone decided not to pursue land speed any farther. Yeah. Uh, during these days, this was in the 1960s, the uh, Firestone and Goodyear tire companies were competing in, in all forms of racing, uh, Indy cars, stock cars, formula cars, the whole mess. So our next option was to talk to Goodyear. Well, we had initially designed the Blue Flame around the 24 inch diameter tire at Firestone. Mm -hmm. Midway through the design uh, part of the project, suddenly we got uh, confirmation from Goodyear they would supply tires, but they wanted 32 inch diameter. So with that, the whole car got larger and we had to redesign everything for that. 
and the rocket engine that we were using uh, also got more powerful and, and uh, the fuel tanks and everything else got bigger. So it was a major, major change, which resulted in some significant delays later. I guess such a project is full of obstacles and challenges. What was your motivation not to give up? Well, okay, first of all, we had, by the time we were out there in Bonneville, we had five years work on this project, beginning with our initial little rockets through the X-1 rocket car, and now building the blue flame and being on the salt flats. But what kept us going is we, we, we continued to improve our, our performance while we were out there. So we were out there five weeks on the salt flats and making uh, necessary improvements to the uh, car, to the, primarily to the rocket engine. And since we kept going faster and faster, we could see the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. And we needed to keep going until we set the record. You have spent a few weeks on the Bonneville Salt Lake in Utah. Can you tell us a little bit more insights how was it? Well, first of all, uh, if you can imagine being on the moon with <laughs> oxygen, <laughs> that was the Bonneville Soft Flats. So we were uh, in the middle of nowhere, literally, uh, out there running the car and trying to overcome various difficulties while we were on the Soft Flats. So every time we had to make a change, we had problems of finding uh, materials, of finding uh, sources of machining and whatever we needed to uh, keep the project going. Uh, also, we were running out of fuel. We were shipping fuel in by train, rail, rail by train. And uh, so, you know, we, we, like I say, you're literally in the middle of nowhere, yeah. which is an American expression. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we had a lot of uh, support from the people in nearby Wendover, a little village, and uh, they were they were pushing us on too and trying to help whatever they could. Looking back in time, do you see the project now more technically or emotionally? Well, okay. Uh, scientifically, well, if that's the word, uh, in the 1960s, the land speed records were being set uh, by Arfons, Breedlob, and so forth, by people who were buying uh, aircraft turbojet engines and then finding out how fast they could go. We approached it from a different angle. We decided how fast we wanted to go, and mm -hmm. then we designed the rocket and the car to go that fast. So it was a totally different challenge in our part. Mm -hmm. 50 years of blue flame, what does this mean to you personally? Well, first of all, uh, the, the idea that we set a record uh, in the kilometer of 1,014 kilometers per hour that lasted 27 years, uh, I thought was phenomenal. Uh, we had wanted to go back and go supersonic the following year, but uh, the events wouldn't allow that to happen due to sponsorship and whatever. But uh, it was 27 years later, finally, that uh, Thrust SSC did go supersonic. So we felt we were a significant step in the history of the land speed record. You know, the Technic Museum in Sinsheim is the home of the Blue Flame since, uh, since the early 1990s. Because of COVID-19, it's almost impossible to travel be between the countries. So do you have plans to come over to the museum to see the museum and to see your blue flame? Well, obviously, we have plans to come this year. And in fact, uh, I have relations in uh, Germany, in Brodenbach and other places, and we have friends in Strasbourg, France. So my wife and I had definitely planned a an extensive trip over there this year. Uh, but I think we will uh, want to uh, travel next year if it's possible uh, and, and repeat that, that trip that we had planned. Dick, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for the interview. 
I wish you all the best. Thank you. Well, I wish you guys the best too. Keep it up over there in Sunshine. <laughs>